This is episode three, interview with the recovering pay pig, a financial domination addict. Welcome to Light Workers Who Play in the Dark, where we bring the darkness into the light. I'm your host, Mistress Damiana Chi, and I have been a professional dominatrix for over two decades. I'm also a certified sexologist and a kink life coach. I hold a PhD and a master's degree in psychology. I am the founder of the Evolutionary Dominatrix Academy and the creator of Conscious Kink Community. These podcast episodes will feature different themes like Q&As, where I answer kink-related questions from my listeners, topic interviews with people in the BDSM community, and femdom psychodrama scenes in which I dominate a submissive while you listen in as we get into some dom space and subspace together. Now, let's get on with the episode. This interview is a really important one. I believe that this interview with the recovering pay pig also called a fin sub or financial domination addict, is the first of its kind. I hope that everyone in the BDSM community will listen to this episode and have it be a real wake-up call to what is happening to all these people who are being damaged by the people who are exploiting them for selfish gain. I think that listening to this interview will help to humanize pay pigs, and honestly, I'm hoping that it will change the way financial doms see them for good and make them think about things differently. I'm hoping that this will help them see that pay pigs are not pigs and not faceless objects, only to be used for their wallets and thrown away. This isn't something being done within the safe container of a BDSM session. These are real people with real lives that are being negatively affected on all levels, many to devastating degrees. Here is a direct quote from someone I know in the kink community to give you an idea of the degree of devastation and hardship that these fin subs are going through. At my old job, I had several clients, even with their consent, lost thousands of dollars from Vindom. And at worst, my clients ended up owing money for their mortgage, to their lawyers, etc. It was a mess. I don't know what happened to them now, but there are two things I know for sure. They will never get their money back, and... They are emotionally, mentally, and psychologically crushed. It will take many years to recover. When my clients hit the dead end, I usually took over to figure out how to protect them from losing everything. That involved filing a police report, showing lawyers the police report, and negotiating with them, same for their mortgage, finding them a therapist for their mental health, etc. Because their emotional stress interfered with their ability to think, They needed someone like me with a clear mind to help with their situation. My clients were not aware that I was kink friendly. I had to keep a lid on it. Anyways, a few days later, I checked their phones, with their permission of course, and found out my fin sub clients fell in love with their fin doms. They couldn't help but continue sending them more money. I tried to stop them and they flat out refused to listen to me. I had to leave the rest to their therapist. Listening to Matt, not his real name, talk so freely and openly about his fight against his urges to engage in the destructive, addictive behavior of impulsively giving large amounts of money to findoms, with whom he describes as never once having an ethical experience, really makes my heart go out to him and the thousands of others who struggle with this addiction as well. In this episode, Matt talks about how he got into financial domination, also called findom for short, And although he wasn't originally attracted to Findom at all, but was looking for Femdom because he has felt himself to be kinky from birth, no matter where he looked, Findom was in his face. So he started dabbling in it, and then eventually got sucked into it. It's important to understand that the art form and practice of classic female domination goes back hundreds of years. And although there might have been some sort of financial domination being done on some minor scale throughout time, because I'm sure all kinks have been explored at some point or another, It hasn't been to the devastating point it is now. The popularity of Findom has become rampant in the past decade or so and peaking during the last few years. COVID played a big part because more people were resorting to online play and frankly, because people were desperately trying to make a living. But unethically draining other people's bank accounts with no remorse is not okay. Real traditional Femdom is in danger of becoming a lost art 
because the femdom culture is being drowned in the hundreds or thousands of thin doms, outward facing demands for cash. Thin dom represents the main cause of the current declining state of online female domination. But thankfully, it's not lost yet, and there are many BDSM educators out there keeping our beloved craft alive and strong, me being one of them. During the last five years of my career as a professional dominatrix, I've trained hundreds of students from the perspective of classic femdom. So we conscious doms are out there. You just have to do your research and look for them. And I really do hope that those subs who have been caught up in the web of femdom can make the healthy choice of finding their way towards conscious femdom. And now without further delay, here is the interview with Matt. Well, hello, Matt. You are are the first. (laughs) I'm I'm (laughs) doing well. You are the first pay pig that I've ever met through Instagram that I don't know already that I I met through a DM. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I've had other pay pigs DM me and they just get deleted as as along with a lot of other slaves who DM me and get deleted because most DMs that we get, I mean, we get tons of these on a daily basis, me and other, other doms, other mistresses, um, other DMs that a lot of DMs that say, hi, mistress, or can I be your slave or, or, or something just in, 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 insignificant like that. And those just get deleted because they're really just kind of like time wasting, DMs. We don't have time to do this, like have a DM conversation with, with people like that. So, but what you wrote me yesterday was so touching and it really moved me, moved my heart. And, and so I, I responded and this is what you wrote. I'm going to read what you wrote so that everyone can, who's listening can, can get a sense of this. Okay. It says, hi, mistress, you probably won't even see this, but just wanted to reach, wanted to type it out anyway. I wanted to reach out and thank you for your stance on financial domination. It really means a lot coming from such a respected and consummate BDSM practitioner. Unfortunately, I happen to be a younger pay pig in my early twenties who can't seem to break my addiction that has worsened over the years. I've experienced significant financial and mental hardship due to this play. It's disappointing to see Findom glorified so much in the media when I have been engaging for years and have yet to experience an ethical dynamic. The same goes for many others I know who struggle badly and have even resorted to therapy. I'm going to try my best to lessen my engagement, but just wanted to thank you for speaking up for us who have been exploited and ruined in many cases. Love your work, mistress. Have a great day. Well, and, glad I got to change um, it up from your typical requests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm really happy to to read this to to hear this from you because you know even in this first DM, we, we, you said that the that you know others who have struggled badly with this, and that was enlightening to me because I didn't know that. I mean. In general, I know that subs don't usually talk about their involvement in BDSM to other subs. It's just a really private thing. So um, I'm going to ask you about that in a little bit. But before I do that, I would love for you to introduce yourself and just, you know, tell me a little bit about who you are, your background, um, field of work, your upbringing, things like that. Absolutely. So my name is Matt. I'm 25 years old. I work primarily in the field of, let's just say, finance, and I do some work in the side on data analytics and some business consulting work as well. Um, So initially, I grew up and had a pretty prototypical upbringing, had a healthy family, um, both parents, great relationships with both of my parents still to this day. Um, And then it typically, when I was younger, I realized that I wasn't into the normal sexual behavior that mainstream media kind of portrayed. Um, So I went into the route of searching up a lot of different things from a young age, was always curious, was trying to find new things. 
And around the age of the middle school time period, I would say that I came across specifically a femdom or female domination. Um, noticed that immediately it had an appeal to me, did not understand why, did not understand why I was into it, just understood that it did have some sort of attraction. Um, so going up, growing up through middle school, through high school, I had girlfriends, different relationships, and there was never a fulfilling sexual arrangement within those relationships. And I always thought that I would be able to separate my my femdom or female domination and BDSM participation or, or appreciation aside from the normal or what I thought was normal sexual behavior. Um, and then it hit me <laughs> late middle, late high school, not middle school, late high school, that it was because I had this disposition to be attracted to BDSM and to a lot of different fetishes. Um, so with that being said, mm -hmm. kept up my participation within watching femdom content and that kind of grew from different fetishes so started out on the lighter end and kind of grew up um, was never into a lot of the more pain-esque or sadomasochistic uh, fetishes if you will but more into the verbal and the the psychological uh, verbal degradation verbal humiliation a lot of those different kinks um, and so the end of high school going into college is when I first came across FINDOM, or as Mr. alluded to, financial domination. Um, and I didn't think that I would have a spot within this fetish, uh, primarily because one, I was a person who being on the younger end did not have the greatest access to funds at that stage in my life, of course. And two, I just didn't see the appeal. I saw different videos and, and previews and clips for it, but I, I was thinking to myself, like, what, why would you engage in such a behavior? What's the incentive to do so. Um, mm -hmm. So then got to college, started to look at it more and more for some reason. I think there was this mystique to it. And then finally, once I graduated from college um, and I primarily, I studied finance in college. So I have a financial background, business acumen. Um, I have a degree at the bachelor's level um, and then got out. When I first got my first big boy job is when I initially decided to engage in a little bit of fin FinDom activity. So it started very small. It was like ten, twenty dollars. Yeah, let's let's, let's, uh, let's let's like kind of like slow down right there, mm -hmm. to because I'm really curious about, you know, like you didn't see the appeal, but then you just wanted to dabble in it, and you know, usually there's like an initial dom who kind of gets you into it, or something like that, like a person who pulls you into it, um, you know, in, in your initial experiences. So what made you want to start dabbling in it all of a sudden since you weren't attracted to it before? To be quite honest, I don't know if there's an exact moment where I could trace back and determine why I decided to engage in it. I think it was more so I viewed it as this association of femdom or female domination. Um, and I viewed it as a form of female domination where there would be this ultimate sacrifice. And I guess there was this mystique of mm -hmm. sending money to someone who, yeah. you know, you don't really know. And is it because you've seen, you, were you bombarded with content about FinDom? Like when you were on the internet, kind of like looking at stuff and was it always in your face? FinDom, it was. you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was. That's... Even in high school, I remember when I was watching a lot of femdom content, the related videos would always include some sort of financial domination video or teaser or something of that sort. Yes. Yeah. That's unfortunate. And that's, that's what I kind of figured. Um, you know, I, I come from the, you know, old school BDSM, uh, meaning the time that I started was late 90s and so internet wasn't even that popular back then um you know the doms that that were advertising as professionals advertised from a little newspaper just like that you get on the corner and street corner kind of a thing kind of a thing and so internet advertisements or profiles of doms wasn't really out there yet and and then even when it started fin dom wasn't that much of a thing it was like barely, it was not associated, with, it was definitely not associated with BDSM. It was like an offshoot, like not, not connected really. I mean, you know, 
And so the way it looks now, where it's it just it's side by side, like FinDom and FemDom are side by side as as you're describing, is is unfortunate and shocking to me. And that's why I've written some of the articles that, you know, like the one I showed you, the one that I, I'm I'm going to put out again. Actually, I put, I took it down because I got a lot of slack for it, but uh, I'm going to put it back up after this interview. So anyway, yes. You, so you're saying you saw FinDom and FemDom kind of like coinciding next to each other and it was in your face, right? I did, yes. Regardless of the medium, whether it was a standard social media platform so such as Twitter, whether it was Instagram to some degree, not as much as Twitter, and even FetLife, mm -hmm. if you primarily approached some sort of Dom, even if they didn't advertise that they were seeking a FinDom relationship, when you would send a message or try to engage or spark a relationship or just initiate a conversation immediately now, at least nowadays, the general consensus will be that there will typically be a FinDom requirement to that relationship, even if it's not explicitly a FinDom relationship. Mm, yeah. See, I wasn't aware of that either. You know, um, when I train, I, I have an academy that I, where I train dominatrix, dominatrices and you know, that's not a thing. We don't, I don't teach FinDom. And when, when a client is applying to book a session with me, you know, I will ask for a small fee for a phone conversation so I can interview them, get to know them and see if this is a fit. And then I ask for the deposit, which is a hundred dollar deposit that goes towards the session tribute, you know? And so there's no FinDom. And I don't see a reason for them to be FinDom. I think it's, <laughs> so for, for you to say that most DOMs out there who are, that you're connecting with are asking for some aspect of financial domination when you contact them, it's astounding to me. It's, it's shocking. It's, you know, I, I had no idea this was going on to this degree because um, I, I can say I mean, I'm willing to put it out there and just, this is, this is a guess, but I'm willing to put it out there that, I don't know, the larger percentage of doms out there who call themselves doms are not trained dominatrices because they're doing it this way. Having FinDom as the, the front facing thing, you know, between like, you get to have access to me or not. Right. I would agree with that sentiment. Yes. So, so that's just based off my personal observations, but however, I have tried to partake in a lot of different arrangements. So at least what I've come across, whether it was again, Twitter, FetLife, most do try to co-mingle the FinDom aspect into it. Even if you're not asking for that type of relationship and you're asking, even if you explicitly kind of mention your kinks or what you're seeking out of that relationship or a session, there's still, yes, I'll do this, but you have to do this, or there's still a, like a quid pro quo as far as incorporating FinDom into it, at least what mm -hmm. I've seen in my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your experience is, you know, you being in your early 20s, um, it's, it's very interesting to me what the society looks like now, like the BDSM society. It's so different from, from what it originally came from. It's changed so much. So I think that your experience is probably a very common one for those who are just, you know, within these last few years getting into BDSM or trying to get into the world of femdom. Um, so I, I think that it's what you're experiencing is what a lot of people are experiencing right now. Right. And I also want to say like right here in the beginning that I don't believe that um, ethical financial domination is a bad thing when eth when they when it's done ethically between two people and there's trust in and there's um you know there it like you said there's a healthy you said that you were trying you wanted to look for a healthy Vindom relationship and wasn't able to I think it's very possible and as a matter of fact I have a pay pig myself who I've been in relationship with for close to 30 years now. Um, he was my very first slave and we're still in contact and we still talk on the phone. Uh, we do phone, phone domination now. And FinDom is, 
is one of the main things that we do. And so it is possible, it is possible to have a FinDom relationship with a DOM that is ethical. I know that there's DOMs out there doing it. So I just want to say that up front here to say that I'm not anti FinDom. I am anti unethical FinDom. I would share the same sentiment. So as you alluded to your article that you had published a few years back, I would agree that financial domination in and of itself isn't necessarily an issue or isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think the application of it, or in my take, how prevalent and how it's utilized today on a wide scale, I think that's more so the issue. Um, and I think it's rooted in a lot of unethical behavior. I think it's a lot of ill intent, but financial domination in and of itself, I don't have an issue with. It's just how the relationship dynamics are structured today and the level of exploitation that I've experienced and that many that I correspond with have experienced as well. Right. So unethical FinDom would be a DOM doing it for selfish gain without consideration for the person's well-being, you know, emotional, psychological, financial well-being. That would be my definition of, that would be my short definition of unethical FinDom. So, and I also likened to, you know, when I, I said this to you on the DM, I liken it to, um, so financial, be, so someone who's addicted to financial domination being like a heroin addict, and then the DOM, the unethical FinDom being a dealer and kind of like, you know, giving the drug and giving the drug and just selling the drug to this addicted person who can't control themselves and really have, has no, just, you know, kind of like, give me the cash and that's all I care about. I have, I don't, I don't care what happens to you after you take the drug, just go. <laughs> right. You know, and that, that's, that's the, that's the image that I have of what's going on. Yeah. I, myself, I never had any addictive tendencies as a kid that I noticed at least. So for me, it was kind of interesting to find myself wrapped up in, in an addiction like this because initially I was engaging in it. Like I said, small amounts, the small amounts of course developed due to tolerance, but still it never struck me as an addiction. It just seemed like something I was engaging in. And at times it struck me as something maybe I shouldn't have been engaging in to that extent, uh, but nonetheless, it, it wasn't an addiction per se in my view until one day where I realized it was the financial hardship that I was facing. And I said, okay, well, maybe I should take a step back here. Or I should try to at least, you know, set up some limits and establish some more boundaries so that I don't get uh, destroyed financially to the, at least harm to the extent that I was, I was getting exploited. And then when I tried to take some of those steps and I noticed that it was hard and that I couldn't take those steps, that's clearly when it was evident that there was an addiction present. And then when you try to mm. stop the addiction and you can't, then you know it's a pretty strong addiction. Right. And I would I would describe financial domination addiction um, just like any other addiction, which is an unhealthy, extreme, unsustainable behavior that you can't stop. That is making it so that it's ruining parts of your life, you know, like your your personal life, your sex life, your your work life or, you know, your financial life, of course. So this is a dangerous one because it's kind of like a mixture of, you can mix sex addiction with gambling addiction and you get financial domination addiction because it's, it's, it's like both. It's like two addictions in one. So can you describe a little bit, Matt, about just how, ex how extreme has gotten and how out of control has gotten for you personally? Sure. So for myself personally, I started, I would say around college age viewing it, high, end of high school, college age to at least view Findom content. But like I said, I didn't initially engage and participate until I first got my big boy job and just out of college. So I was, that's when I was really starting to send. And that's when the amounts were very minimal, very little, 10, $20 sends. I think 50 would have been like, whoa boy. And then at that point, kind of blossomed and grew. And over the months, the 50 turned into 100, 100 turned into 200, um, up the way to 500. And then I would say around a year in is when the amount started to get more serious and serious to a degree of which I, in my financial position and standing at that time, should not have been engaging. 
um, or at least sending those types of amounts. And the amounts were $500, $1,000. Uh, it's gotten to a point personally for myself where it, or it at least got so bad where I had all of my kind of investments and savings and everything, and I, I depleted my whole financial net worth um, prior to the age of, I think I still was, might have been 24 at that time, yeah. So depleted everything that I worked mm -hmm. for, everything that I had. And, and mind you, I had student debt. I had uh, bills to pay just coming out with my first couple jobs in life. So to have mm -hmm. Findom debt and to, to deplete my savings in that way did not help my cause. Um, but the amounts definitely rose, like I said. And it got to the point where $1,000, $1,500, those wallet draining sessions um, were not, were basically the new normal for me because the the two hundred dollar, even three hundred dollar sessions just weren't getting my my needs fulfilled or my my satisfaction just because of how the tolerance mm. grew. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's I'm so sorry that happened to you, Matt. I hope that things are getting better for you now. Um, so this is um. It's very unfortunate. You also said that you know that you're in a FINDOM addiction recovery group, which is very interesting to me. And and I'm so happy to hear about some this because I didn't know that this thing existed. As I said, I didn't, you know, as a norm, subs don't talk to each other about their kinks, but you say that you know others who are uh, as addicted and, and, and as, as, as suffering as much as you are. Will you talk Correct. about that a little bit? Yes, I should preface. It's not a formal group or there's no uh, therapist or clinician that leads the group or psychologist. And, and like you did say, it is wow, true that should be. most subs <laughs> within the scene, right? Most subs mm -hmm. within the scene will not discuss kind of what they're into or kind of their relationships at that time. So you, that's very accurate. I personally, I never discussed what I was into while really hardcore engaging. Um, but I came to find a group of, of people going through the same experience I mean, it is a Findom addiction recovery group, and it's basically a bunch of um, some, I hope you can say at this point, former fin subs, and, and most are still struggling and battling the addiction and dealing with those those repercussions. Um, and incredibly, the age varies within the group. I, we've seen some 18, 19-year-old kids come, or I say kids, but young adults. Uh, they've come in with very very dire situations and, and having fi significant financial hardship, um, even wow. doubling what I've experienced when I was at, you know, the age a couple of years back. Mm. So even like they're on a path right now to double where I was and I had it pretty rough. Mm. So I'm like, oh, if you could, if I could just impact their life and kind of give them my experiences. So everybody feeds off um, everybody else's mm -hmm. common experiences to try to lessen their engagement and to, to stay as clean as possible. Wow, that's so. It's not formally led by anyone. It's not formally led, no. So I, I wouldn't, you know, say it's. I shouldn't say that, but it, it's a more, just commonalities between mm -hmm. former and yeah. current fin subs who are just trying to kick the addiction and trying to stop it. Right. That's really great, and so I almost don't want to <laughs> have you reveal where to find this group because I'm afraid of. Findom's infiltrating it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's part of the problem. So, is we, we have a vetting process because there have been oh, good. Doms who've tried good. to get in and have tried to, like you said, infiltrate it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, you know, I am creating a community, an online community called Conscious Kink Community.com, where I'm vetting people. I, I, I haven't officially launched it yet, but it's go it's right around the corner, you know, right around the time I'm going to launch this podcast. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing. I am going to vet people who want to want a kink community that does not have Vindoms in there, um, does not have people, you know, kind of airing their negativity towards other people or, um, or talking about their political opinions that offend other people and things like that. So it's going to be a, a real kink community uh, with people that are supportive of one another. And so this is what I'm, I'm planning to build. And I would love to have a, a fin sub group in there, a fin sub support group in there. And it could be like this, like it could be, it could be, um, you know, led by you in my Academy of Doms. 
I run a, a femdom academy called the Evolutionary Dominatrix Academy, where we have, you know, I run a, co a, co a coaching call every week where I and my sub coaches run an official like educational coaching call. But once a week, they've started to have their own support group like their own, you know, run by a, di a different dom each week kind of a thing. So what I imagine, and this is this is me just coming up with the idea right now as we speak, I am, I'm imagining a group of fin subs. Um, it could be, you know, you, you could be running the first weekly Zoom and then um, the second week, somebody else can can run it like that and just have it be a place a safe place for people to support one another so yeah i don't know I where your group idea. is right now but you can bring them over <laughs> bring them Absolutely. over so and have it be in this in the safe community and protected community yeah i think i think that's a vital resource and today with just the prevalence of again seeing these young young adults coming in and, and having these situations and circumstances, I think that having a community like that, um, because right. I, I do know some fin subs who have gone to therapists and have sought therapy and have sought uh, professional and, cl and clinical help. And unfortunately, since FinDom addiction is not sought about it, it typically gets categorized under either a compulsive disorder, like an, like trying to treat an OCD issue or trying to treat, mm. and, and of course could be a tie. However, it's either OCD mm -hmm. or it's sex addiction. And oh, while that's too bad. Plays, right. While it plays on the edges, FinDom is very, it has the specific mechanism. Like, like you said, it is an addiction, does have the normal addictive components, but it is innate in the sense that there's a lack of understanding about it. It involves tolerance as drug addiction or sex addiction would or, or gambling. Um, but, but the idea of how also financial domination today there's a portion where there's this relapsing portion of financial domination where a dom would be incentivized to get a sub to relapse. And I think financial domination is the only place I've ever right. seen where you can prey on somebody's addictive tendencies, have them relapse, and it would be considered a win. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think therapy is a great thing. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate and... I think that therapists who would be a fit for this type of thing would be, you know, a kink aware or a kink knowledgeable therapist who is knowledgeable about BDSM and about financial domination and can do therapy with addiction as well. You know, so it would be like someone who with all those skills. Right. So, so relating back to one of the members who, who sought out a therapist, he said that, that that therapist kind of took it in, in a joking manner when they brought up financial domination. They were like, what? Like you're sending money for the purpose of, of nothing? And I was like, well, that's, oh, that's, that's going to be a helpful, helpful discourse, right? No, no, no. no just but, walk away. Don't ever go back yeah, to that Yeah, therapist. immediately. Yeah. But specifically for myself, it's it's we, we do talk about specifically with other members. If you can try to trace back and determine what incentive not what incentives but what maybe what events and maybe even traumatic experiences as you alluded to kind of influence that and for some people right off the bat they can find some triggers which would be um, openly admitting that they have low self-worth or low self-esteem or maybe weren't the best with girls because a lot of people that i found are, that are into financial domination or that say they're into financial domination are not actually into financial domination and what i mean is the kink or the engagement of sending money is not actually something that turns them on. It's that they're seeking that out of necessity to fulfill uh, boredom or lack or the inability to have a or find a partner. A lot of people cannot find partners within this group or have trouble with finding partners and they couldn't get their needs met. So they're paying women for kind of the act of just kind of talking to them all day. But of course there could be better mm -hmm. outlets to do such a thing. So there's a lot of different incentives. And for myself, it was the thrill-based aspect. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I, like I said, there had, it had this mystique to it initially, but that mystique kind of lessened and it was this thrill of sending these copia, these large amounts and for no reason at all. And psychologically to yeah. my mind, it was, it was this, th this massive thrill because I never had mm -hmm. issues with you know, low self-esteem or low worth or, or getting girlfriends, although I didn't even like the sexual components because it wasn't kink-based. 
but I still didn't have a need per se, except for the thrill and my, of course, attraction to uh, femdom and different kinks mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, right. So yeah, this is this is a good point. You know, not all, not everyone who's kinky is kinky because something happened that triggered that kink. You're some people are kinky because it is how you're wired. It's it's a it's kink is an actual sexual orientation. It's a, like a disposition, like you said earlier. Um, it's how you're. That's how you came to be. And uh, you know, I know many subs who I. I've asked, you know, so when did you first discover you were kinky? And they said, um, I think I, I think I was kinky in the womb. <laughs> like this yeah. is, yeah. I came out this way, you know? Yeah. Same here. Uh, and so it's, yeah. And, and that's, that's great. Like that's, and that's what some of these therapists who aren't kink aware don't understand. They don't understand that it is, it's, it's, it is a sexual orientation, just like, being homosexual, heterosexual, you know, being kinky is, it's how you're made. And that's, that's it. You know, I, I want to mention something about, you know, because I, I talk about BDSM as a he healing modality and it very much can be so, but if it's done a certain way. So when I was going through graduate school for, in my, in my master's program and in my doctorate program for psychology, I took courses in psychodrama and psychodrama is, is a, is a form of therapy where you enact. It's very much like a BDSM session where there's usually two people, you know, the client and the therapist. And then in, in the, in the BDSM session, in the case of that, it would be the sub and the dom where, you know, when, when I do sessions, it is psychodrama and it is an actual healing modality because there's a, a bond and a, and a forming of trust that happens in the beginning where, you know, I talk to the person, we talk about how, you know, I, I want to know how, what their fantasies are, what they want to experience and everything, you know, I just kind of get everything that I, I can get out of them so that I can create a scene, a domination scene that would best fit their fantasy. And I mean, I, you know, I can go as dark as I want with this. I can go to humiliation, degradation. I can go to all of these places with this and make them feel like the lowliest slug on the planet. Like that, if that's their fantasy, you know what I mean? Right. In like hardcore de degradation type of, if this is my example. And then, you know, and have it, have it come, go through all the, the, this, the, the scene where it's, it, um, it begins, it escalates, it intensifies, and then it, and then it ends in this, you know, really exciting way. And then at the end of a session, at the end of the session, there'll be like a coming together, you know, there will be like, um, some people call it aftercare and aftercare looks different in different after different scenes and in the case of something like this where it's you know, a client i'm not going to necessarily hug them or something but you know uh, i'll say wow you know like wow that was really intense that was a really intense scene like you went deep didn't you something like that and that would be my way of checking in and connecting with that person and letting them know like hey i'm here with you outside the scene you know, mm. so it's, it's, it's setting it up in this way. It's, you know, there's a format to it where there's a connection in the beginning, there's the scene, and then there's a connection at the end. In other connect, in other endings, you know, there, the aftercare might look, um, more affectionate or something like that, depending on the person, just different subs are different, you know, mm -hmm. but this this is the format that I'm talking about that is a healing way to do BDSM. When, when fin doms out there are doing financial domination and just kind of like just letting, letting it hang without a connection at the end, it's not healing. You know what I mean? And so 
like with my fin sub that I've had for 30 years, the connection could be at the end, something like I'm laughing <laughs> or I'm, um, I'm saying, okay, you know, like you're, you're going to go, go do this other thing now or, or something to make it like, to make the, um, to humanize the experience, make it known. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. To humanize and to be like, to make them know like, okay, till next time, you know what I mean? Like that right. kind of a thing. Um, and I don't think that it would take away from the mystique. I think that you tell me though, you know, I'm, I want to ask you, I know part of what you say about the mystique of being financially dominated is giving money to a person who is this cold hearted woman who doesn't care about you and all that. But what if there was something like this? What if there was a connection in, at the end of it? Personally for Even myself. the slightest. Right. Okay. So I, I would just start off and preface that I have yet to experience in my years with Infindom any remote form of aftercare. Um, and I think that just ties back to how transactional, I guess you can say, Findom has become. And of course, I wasn't around in the 90s and the early 2000s of, of when Findom um, still existed, but wasn't, I guess, to, to the wallet draining-esque level that it is today. And, and so with that, I, I think the whole experience has become transactional to the point where there's this picture, or there's this this pig picture, and you can go up and approach a dom, find a dom within five, 10 seconds today, or a dom in quotes, um, a dom who certainly likely has not invested significant time, effort, financial resources into understanding how to um, read and, and pick up on different dynamics and read the energy so that you can understand where, where a submissive is coming from. And I don't think that a lot of people treat it as a craft. And I think it, it dilutes BDSM. Um, and granted, I don't mm -hmm. have the most experience with BDSM, but I, I still think it's it's diluted when you have this transactional element of FinDom where you can, access, accessibility is off the charts. You can find a DOM in 10 seconds, approach said DOM. She can drain you of $500, $1,500, not really know your age, not know your certain situation, not understand your limits, right. not understand your needs, um, but take that money and not, you know, separate or, pro or provide any form of aftercare. So it's a totally dehumanizing experience because it's easy. I guess it's easier to exploit someone when you don't see a physical face or see a connection because it's not a human that I guess you're participating with. And I think that's what makes the current form of financial mm. domination so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right about all of that. That is why one of the reasons why I wanted you on the call is to humanize fin subs. They are people who have lives who <sighs> these fin doms are, are affecting in a very, very negative way on, you know, across the board. And like you said, it's easy to just think of them as this, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're just a wallet to you, right. but it is dangerous. Um, and yeah. I, and I agree with you that it, there's, there's no craft being practiced out there with the FinDom. Right. And to your point, so, I think um, that the, in, the, the, Incorporation of aftercare, I don't think that that would lessen the experience. I think myself at first, there was this mystique of where I wouldn't initially maybe have wanted that, but over the over the course, I don't think that that would cheapen the experience at all. And, and where I'm at personally with respect to viewing financial domination is I think that that would increase the the health of, of a financial relationship dynamic. I think if, if the, the, the dominant is coming from a good place with good intentions, and I think the sub's coming from a good place where they're not engaging out of necessity, but rather because of desire, I think that in and of itself is a healthy relationship or could be a healthy relationship. Yeah. I think it gets blurry right. when a dom wants to just basically um, engage in this activity, not for the craft or the love of BDSM, but just simply for the result of self-gain, um, even at the expense yeah. of human beings on the other side. Correct. Exactly. Thank you for that, Matt. 
You know, uh, I read a book recently that I think I want to mention here because I think it would, I think it would help a lot of fin subs out there. The book is called, I love myself as my, uh, if my life depended on it. I don't remember the author's name at the moment, but it was a really good book. It's a really practical book on how to do self-love. And, you know, self-love is such a, it's a nebulous concept. It's like, what, how do you do that? Okay. I guess I love myself, but you know, uh, but the, it's basically, it teaches you to, you know, there's these rituals of saying to myself, I love myself kind of like throughout the day. And then, and then it was checking in with my, yourself, kind of like asking yourself, well, first of all, doing the practice of I love myself and just kind of repeating that as a mantra. And then when you come to different points of your day, ask yourself, if I love myself, would I do this? You know, and it could be something as small as if I love myself, would I eat this bag of chips to if I love myself, would I, would I call this woman right now and, and give her a thousand dollars? And just to do that check-in with yourself before you do those actions that could potentially harm yourself, you know, all these, all these actions are harmful, right? Like eating a whole bag of chips or, or, or draining your pocketbook, um, out of money that you could be using for something that's better, you know, like put that money towards buying yourself healthy groceries or, or, or getting a gym membership or, or something that's self-loving, a loving act, um, rather than a self-sabotaging act. So anyway, I think that self-love is a practice that can really help people. I think it can help everyone. Um, but specifically speaking of fin subs out there, I think that check-in would really just, you know, if you take a moment before you make a decision like that, uh, that it would be, it would be helpful. What do you think, Matt? I think so. I think being present, like there'd be a presence within that moment instead of just generally thinking, because I, it's interesting. I view myself in a high regard. Like I, I've always had, I don't want to say arrogance, but I've, I viewed myself generally always in a, in a positive light through every aspect. Um, it's just that there is no other way to put it. You're right in the sense that this activity, especially to the degree that I've been engaging is absolutely self-harm in, in that regard. It's self sab It is. And I think at least being present, if I really did love myself, like I think I love myself, then would I really do that? And I think that opens up some right. questions about, you know what I mean? Self-evaluating where maybe if I could change certain things, even if I don't know them right now on this call, maybe if I look, there are things I need to work. I don't know. Maybe, probably, <laughs> but, but yeah, if I, like, I don't know. It, it definitely is number one, an inconvenient fetish. Even if it was healthy, it's still inconvenient, which is fine because that can be accommodated for if it's still healthy, but the, to the, to a high degree and, and significant hardship and, and being younger and depleting your standing and ruining your future and, or making it hard for yourself. I mean, that's, that's definitely not a way that you would show right. that you love yourself. Right. And it, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not something that immediately shows as harmful. Like if you, right. you know, like if you drink a bottle of wine, okay, you get a hangover. That's like an immediate, um, after, after effect. So uh -huh. if you, send a thousand dollars. It's like, you don't really look at your bank account. You don't really feel it. And it's like, you don't really realize <laughs> until, um, so yeah, you're right. It's, it's something that you can just kind of not think about and ignore and not, not really realize how much it's harming you. Uh, but it is for all those reasons that you mentioned. Right. And it's digital. So like today you don't even see the money, you know, releasing from exactly. your pocketbook. Exactly. You don't feel it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think this was a very, very enlightening call, Matt. I, I really appreciate you um, speaking with me and just being so open about this issue. I think it's very, very important to bring light to it. And uh, yeah, any, th any last words you want to say here? 
I would just end by saying that I think to to whoever is listening, because I know that someone listening to this will be someone who's dealing with this. And I just want to reinforce, not to be cliche about it, but there definitely is people, there definitely are people who have experienced or are experiencing what you are experiencing. So you're, you're completely not alone. You're not going crazy. You're not, you know, an outlier. There are people that are, are battling with this. This is a much more prevalent issue than what is commonly uh, perceived, especially within the mainstream. So just know that um, through my personal experiences, this, this can be battled and it might take a lot of exploration to find the ways to deal with it. But ultimately at the end of the road, uh, I would not lose faith. I, I've seen it with members of our group. There absolutely is hope, but you have to believe in that hope for it to first exist. So just stay strong if you're out there. You're not insane and you're going to do great. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that message, Matt. Um, it's I'm mean, just giving chills just hearing that. Yeah, I, I I'm also I'm, I'm sending the same sentiment out there. You're not alone. You you are definitely supported by me. I I'm going to look for the consciouskinkcommunity.com. It's going to be out soon. It might be out by the time this podcast airs. And apply, apply, because I'm going to carefully select people that are coming in. There's not going to be any fin doms. Um, and I'll set up a group for fin subs so that you can all kind of like support each other. And what I want to do, what I would love to do is see, this is part of my mission. I want to bring traditional domination back, you know, traditional female domination, which it's what you want as a fin sub is domination. That's the hot part of it. You want to be dominated by a female. Like that's, that's the part that's the, the exciting, you know, hot part of it. And so I believe that the kink of financial domination can be transferred to other kinks. And then you could still be kinky. You could still get that thrilling, you know, uh, the, those, the, all those, those good feeling hormones that like coursing through, um, kind of like when you're sending cash to someone that you don't know, you, you feel those same, that, the, that same excitement with other kinks. I'm absolutely sure of it. So you're just not exposed to it. That's, that's the problem. So that's, that's part of my, part of my mission here that I'm going, I'm, I'm training lots of traditional dominatrices out there now, and they are going to be giving, they're going to be providing this real female domination to you. So thank you, Matt, so much. This was a wonderful talk. And I, I hope that we can keep building this community, this positive, conscious community with lots of kinksters out there. Love All it. Right, until next time. Goodbye. What an important talk this was. I am truly grateful to Matt for sharing so intelligently, vulnerably, and openly about this very sensitive and pertinent topic in our BDSM community. I feel like we really bonded on the same level of consciousness at the end there when we were talking about what are the choices one would make out of self-love. And I loved his encouraging message to other FinSubs out there as well. That was really powerful. Also, I want to credit the name of the author of the book I referred to called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. The author is Kamal Ravikant. I actually listened to the audiobook version of it, narrated by the author, and he has a really soothing voice. Really enjoyable, helpful book. I caught Matt at a time when he was consciously desiring to kick his addiction to Findom. A few days after our interview, he DM'd me and said that he was about to cancel his Instagram account so he could get away from the addiction. Instagram and Twitter are like unlocked liquor cabinets for addicts. Findoms are ready and waiting any time of the day or night to satisfy that itch for a hit. Three weeks after our interview, I checked in on Matt to see if his Instagram account was still up. It was and it displayed screenshots of several cash app or Venmo cash amounts that he had been sending to Findoms. Amounts from 100 to 300 to 600 to 1000 dollars and with comments saying things like I'm a pathetic loser pay pig and I exist to pay bills for hot girls. 
or please fuck my wallet, or I deserve to struggle while you laugh at me. I'm not mentioning this to shame him in any way. I don't have any judgment on anyone for wherever they are in their journey. People with different addictions relapse all the time, whether it be food or shopping or drinking, and commonly love addiction. Addiction is giving into impulses that make you feel good in the moment, but is not sustained. And then a longer lasting bad feeling results afterwards, like texting an ex when you know you shouldn't, or calling them to listen to their voicemail greeting and hear their voice to get that fix. Most people who have a love addiction don't even know they have a love addiction, and you can't heal something unless you have an awareness and intention to heal it. I'm giving you this example as a way for you to tap into something that might be more common or relatable so you can start having compassion for fin subs and see that they are struggling with an addiction just like you and me, except theirs may be way more damaging on several levels. Relapsing from addictions happens, and the most important thing for people to try not to do is to go into shame when it happens. It takes having a conscious intention and inner strength and discipline to stop yourself from getting that quick hit of dopamine from something that makes you feel good temporarily, but that then makes you feel bad about yourself later. In the interview with Matt, I spoke briefly about psychodrama and how a BDSM or femdom scene uses the same model of three distinct phases, the pre-scene connection, the role play scene, and aftercare. These phases are important to distinguish for a reason. The connection before stepping into the roles, then doing the scene, and then de-rolling, so our psyches are not stuck in that alternate reality. In an in-person BDSM scene, these phases are symbolically represented by coloring the sub at the beginning of the scene and then decoloring them at the end. If it is an online or phone session, you can say something verbally to make it obvious that you're going into scene and ending scene. The problem with unethical findom is that there's no pre-scene connection and aftercare. They're just doing the, the role play all the time. The subs are stuck in this alternate reality all the time, and they lose sense of what is real and what is not, and there's no safe container being built with connection and aftercare. The subs are not cared for at all. It is the opposite. If Findoms did this model of pre-scene connection, and then in-role scene, and then aftercare, the aftercare doesn't necessarily have to be something nice or sweet. It could be simply something like shifting your tone of voice to make it known that the scene is over like laughing or lightening it up and saying, it was so much fun to play with you, or even getting a little serious and saying, look, I loved raping your wallet and it's so much fun for me, but I do not want to put you in the poor house for real. So let's have a real talk about where you are with your finances and how you're actually doing. Fin doms may not even be aware of their wrongdoings because they're not consciously thinking about how their actions might be negatively affecting that live human being on the other end of their DMs. They might be justifying their actions with, well, they consented. Consent doesn't mean a thing when the play is not ethical. When a fin dom irresponsibly takes money from a consenting fin sub whose addiction is negatively affecting his financial, mental, and psychological health, and social life and over, overall quality of life, it is wrong and it is unethical. He is not actually a sub at that point, but a victim of abuse. I referenced an article in this interview, which I renamed Findom is Not Femdom, that I have republished to accompany this episode. You can find a link to it on my website, damianachiphd.com. I really do care so much about supporting recovering fin subs wherever they are in their healing journey and about helping them navigate their way towards healthy, conscious femdom. If they had more exposure to doms who do classic femdom and domination in play with kinks other than money, that would set them on the right track. There is so much psychological power play dynamics that can be played with that they haven't explored yet. Supporting fin subs is a big part of the reason why I created Conscious Kink Community. It's a private social network that is exclusive to personally vetted members only who are a right fit for this special community. And these are kinksters who share a like-minded consciousness about being respectful and supportive of one another in a safe container where we can share and connect about anything kink-related. 
There are strict community guidelines that prohibit the offering and requesting of financial domination, posting about controversial topics, and negative judgment and abuse. There is a huge need for conscious kinksters to be in community with each other without having to deal with fin doms, dom imposters, and con artists. Within this private community, I've created additional private groups that act as safe containers where they can support one another. There's a recovering fin subs support group, a private group for fin subs only, inspired by Matt. And there's another one called Doms in Support of Recovering Fin Subs, where Doms and Fin Subs can connect with one another. There are other groups too, like for pro domination, lifestyle domination, gay and queer group, trans and non binary group. Kinky Book Club, Sacred Sexuality Group, and more. We have deep discussions and light discussions, and it's really fun, and we really do get to know one another. If this fits who you are and you feel a connection to what I described, you are welcome to request to join us at www.consciouskinkcommunity.com. I have really gone on way too long in this episode recap, as you can see. But I am really passionate about helping recovering fin subs find their way to real, authentic femdom. They deserve to have a chance to experience the real thing. Most of my quote unquote best submissives are older in their 50s, 60s, and 70s because they all grew up being trained by real dominatrices doing classical femdom. I want all these young subs to have a chance to have a real sub journey too. I'd like to take a moment to send a very special thank you to a few of my patrons for supporting this podcast. Official patrons Mike L., Betty S., Priestess Francesca, Special Access patrons Duchess Mandalorian, Bonus Content patrons The Duchess and Tracy C., and VIP patron Lisa D. Can't wait to connect with you all behind the scenes. I'd also like to thank my editor, the lovely Mistress Persephone Rose. Love you all and bye for now. Thank you for listening to Lightworkers Who Play in the Dark. I love providing valuable BDSM content to my community. So if you would like to support this podcast, please become my patron by going to patreon.com slash Damiana Chi PhD. My patrons receive different benefits, like asking questions for Q&A episodes, free access to Conscious King Community, and personal video chats with me on a weekly basis. The Patreon link and other links to my different websites, where you can apply for BDSM sessions, kink-centered life coaching, the Evolutionary Dominatrix Academy, and Conscious King Community, can all be found on DamianaChiPhD.com. You can also connect with me on social media at Damiana Chi PhD. If you love the show, please share and subscribe. And until next time, sending love and kinky blessings to you all.